Hi, I'm Lynn Lange, and I'm going to talk today about bleeding edge databases. To frame our discussion, I'll start by having us think about the exponential growth of data in general, but unstructured data in particular. So the point of this presentation is to think not only about alternative problems, but to think about alternative solutions in terms of data bases and data solutions. So we, we all know we have lots of choices beyond relational. We have Hadoop, and we have over 150 different NoSQL databases. This uh, DB Engine ranking is showing the trending popularity this year of the most popular NoSQL databases. And of course, no surprise, Mongo is up on top. And we have some column stores and graph databases that are gaining very quickly in popularity. But the point of this presentation isn't to talk about the most popular NoSQL solutions it's to, to uh, take a look at some of the new types of database solutions that are becoming available. To get us started we're going to frame this problem by thinking about a particular solution and I'll give you a minute to see the problem and then think about how you might solve this with what type of database system. Think about live tweets or live information. How would you make sure that the capacity of your system was able to handle spiky traffic and was able to be scalable and up 100% of the time for this type of solution? What data system would you use? The one that I think is an interesting potential solution to this type of problem is something called AeroSpike. So in selecting bleeding edge databases, I had several criteria. One was fit for the particular set of problems I was interested in. Another one was proven performance via metrics that were independently verified. So AeroSpike is a real-time NoSQL solution that's flash optimized for an in-memory implementation and it has uh, exponential scalability. But the reason that I think for this problem in particular that's interesting is it's um, proven speed, 1 million transactions per second on one server for read heavy activity, 40,000 transactions per second on one server for write activity. And these are independent benchmarks that have been verified multiple times. Additionally, AeroSpike has ACID compliance and tunable consistency. And for a little bit more information about that 1 million transactions on a single server per second, here is some information from the benchmark. And you can see the configuration over on the right. It's AeroSpike 3, a 10 gig network, four node CentOS, 500 gigs of data, 50 million records, and the size of each record. So in the demo, I'm going to show you working with AeroSpike given the utilities and the libraries that are available for it. And the particular implementation I have in the demo happens to run on the Google Cloud. I'm finding the Google Cloud GCE instances or virtual machines are really um, useful and powerful for doing different types of database testing because they're um, relatively cheap, they spin up quickly, and they're powerful. So I'm going to be showing you the download of the Community Edition, which you can get for free. And although you can set it up on EC2, I'm going to go ahead and set it up on the Google Cloud. So I'll give you a link to the instructions. You can also set this up on bare metal if you want to. It runs on Linux, and here's the versions of Linux. And then here's the install instructions. And you've got some install instructions down here. So to do this, what I've done is I've set up an instance on the Google Cloud. And you can see here's Google Compute Engine and Compute Engine. And here's my instance. And in order to connect to this, I'm going to SSH to it using GCUtil. And then I'm going to use the command line to work with it. I've already authenticated uh, with uh, Google Auth. All right, and now I'm connected. So in addition to working directly, I can also uh, programmatically work. Here's the documentation. And you can see here that the way that you work with this is you make your connection, and then you do a put and then a get. There's the get, and here's the put. So in addition to this, you have this console. So you can see once I work with it, um, I can uh, show the latency. Um, I can show statistics. I can show definitions. And it uses a concept of namespaces. So I've got the various namespaces or UDFs. 
and this is a wide column store. You run jobs against it, and here you're going to see the latency, and then you have the admin console. So you can see the configuration. And again, you can select a particular node, you can change the cluster, you can see alerts, and then you can go back to admin. So I'm going to go back to the dashboard, and you can see that I have one node right now, no alerts. And then you'll be able to see the throughput once I run the information through. I'm going to use the Aerospike CLI client, and notice I'm going to use the AQL. So I'm going to drill in, and I'm going to use this uh, setting here, and then I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to alias it first. And you can see this is how you work with this thing. And you start here, and then you alias the client. So you can just call the client. And then you can run operations against the client. So to do a basic put, I can just run a basic put here. And then if I want to see that, like a smoke test basically, I can just run that against it. And there I have success. And then if I want to retrieve it with the CLI, I can just put it in there. And that's basic data manipulation with the AAS CLI client. And you can see inside of here you have the key value operations, which I just ran through. Um, they also have UDFs. You can run queries and manage them, and you can run scans. Now, in addition to this, we have the AQL language. And the AQL language, as it shows right here, can be used for data, UDF, index, so on and so forth. So it's like a SQL syntax. So you can see, if I run AQL help, that's going to give me my AQL commands. And they're pretty extensive. And you can see we've got DDL, DML, and query language. So create index, drop index, insert into, delete from. Then we have our select, and notice that you select from a bin, select a bin from a namespace that has a set. So just a little bit different terminology because it's a wide column store. So here they're showing you an example, and I'll run those examples. So now to get into this, I just type AQL, and that gives me the AQL prompt. And then I want to say show namespaces. Then I want to say show sets. And then I want to say show bins. And I've got one bin, so that's my structure. If I want to do an insert, I just go like this. Insert into, and now I have my insert. If I want to query out, then I'm just going to put in my select star from. Now I don't have users.profiles here, so I'm going to go, uh, let's see what I have, test.demo. And there I have 91 rows in my set. Now you'll see I can do queries like this. I don't have the sample data loaded, but it's um, I've got a where clause here. And I can do an aggregate. Also I can index. So I can do an ag aggregate, so aggregate. And those are the types of queries that I can do. I also can look at statistics. Um, and then I can look at settings. Um, now an interesting thing is I can set the output to JSON which is sort of handy. So I can get output, set it to table, and then I can set the output to uh, JSON if I want to, which is sort of cool. So in addition to this, I have some, um, I have some a log latency tool, and I have a loader. So what this will do is load um, CSV, CSV files in. Now in addition to running from the command line, of course, you can take a look here at the dashboard. So the things that we ran were basically negligible. They just caused a little tiny blip because they were really small. Um, and you can see that if we go up and down here, really, really small because this thing can literally have a huge amount of input um, because it's designed for um, streaming, um, nearly almost literally streaming data in. In addition to that, you can look over here and you can see on the Google Developers Console the kind of instance that we have is a standard. We have two CPUs, 7.5 gigs of memory, so it's not like super powerful. 
um, and then uh, you know just pretty much a basic instance so this is uh, Aerospike running on the Google Cloud so now that you've seen the demo let's talk about some example architectures and this is from Aerospike's own site but the way I see this thing in Aerospike the name comes from the leading tip of a rocket and it really the product itself is aptly named because in the architecture they're showing here this happens to be a shopping architecture the Aerospike servers are sitting on the front of RDBMS data warehouse and Hadoop so that they can like the tip of a rocket capture the information flowing in from the shopper and give the uh, users the ability to do what they call hot analytics. Another aspect that I mentioned earlier that I find very important and a reason that Aerospike warrants consideration is the uh, maturity of their tool set. I use Java to interact with Aerospike and I find that their Java um, Eclipse plugin is very usable. Their libraries are very uh, usable as well. Aerospike also comes with a tool for administration. It's a web browser and it's simple to use and understand. It helps you to monitor your traffic and respond to spikes in traffic and includes the ability to perform live upgrades. So if Aerospike looks interesting to you, I recommend that you try it out. You can go to their website and download the free community edition. You can set it up locally or set it up on one of the various clouds. They have an Amazon implementation, an AMI uh, available, as well as um, some of these other clouds. Like I said, I use the Google Compute Engine. So the next set of problems that I want to consider in this talk is problems not so much of scale, but rather of scale combined with complexity. And to introduce this topic, I want to have us think about some new types of data. So when you think about big data, you think of volume, velocity, and variety. And in this case, we're thinking about variety of data in terms of data that relates to one another. This representation is of linked open data of a type um, uh, RDF or triples. And triples, if you're not familiar, are very English-like in their um, a, a set of data that has a subject predicate and an object, or a subject verb and an object. So it's a graph at scale, if you will. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, drill into this and show you what's at the center and, and uh, just to illustrate this concept a bit more. So here's the visualization of the linked open data cloud. And what this is is ontologies or taxonomies of different types of triple stores that um, can be related to one another. At the center is something called DBpedia. And what this is is Wikipedia shown as a database. So Wikipedia was schema, so it's queryable. So this is a clickable map, so I can click on it. And this will take me to Data Hub, which uh, gives explanation around these, um, these uh, schemas or ontologies. Now, the way that you work with a triple store is a, little, a different type of query than most of us coming out of the relational world are used to. It's called uh, Sparkle is the query language. So this allows us to try out DBpedia through the Sparkle endpoint. And we're going to go ahead and say go to resource. And this is going to open a query editor for us, which will allow us to do a, a Sparkle query against DBpedia so we can get a sense of what this looks like. So to run this, I just click run, and then I can see all the different concepts that are part of the linked open data for DBpedia. Now what kind of problems relate to linked open data and triple stores? For us to think about this, I'm going to show you a snippet from a video talking about uh, smart buildings. So let's uh, think in the context of uh, rather than us interacting with buildings, buildings interacting with us. You can see this is showing the inside of a building and sensors. The idea is that sensors will be a pervasive part of our life and sensors will communicate to one another via software that we write. This is called the Internet of Things. And then our environment will adjust based on the results of the real-time sensor information. So there will be a complexity along with a, a, a sustained increase in data flow which will result in this case in a smart building. So again my question to you is what kind of data solution would you use as an architect to support this type of implementation? A database system of interest in the IoT space is Algebraics Data. Algebraics Data includes an engine that has been rewritten using pure mathematics to support 
querying the complex IoT semantic web. The current implementation supports triple stores or RDF data, graphs at scale, has been benchmarked with 1 billion triples on one node. Now there are several different types of benchmarks and notice no other vendor has reported results for all queries on data sizes above 5 million triples. So it's substantially better performance. So more about their product, which is called the Sparkle Server. It's W3C and OGC compliant, RDF and Sparkle semantic database, built natively with proprietary math. In terms of the processing engine, there are multiple patents associated with the product. It runs on commodity hardware, so the idea is it can scale all the way down to running on uh, sensor devices and all the way up to cloud implementations. Again, for consistency, I built my demo out on Google Compute Engine, got Google Compute Engine on Windows with the Sparkle server for the demo. So in the demo, you're going to see me um, uh, use remote desktop to connect to an Algebraics instance and um, work with a tool that is not part of Algebraics, it's just used to demonstrate the Sparkle queries. It's a Flint query editor and browser that runs in Chrome. So at this time, in order to access this, you'd have to go to the Algebraics data website and click on the sign up the, for the Sparkle server evaluation. This recording is being done in June 2014, and Algebraics anticipates this being available in July. So to start, what I had done is I created on my Google Cloud project, a Google Compute Engine, a new instance that was of type Windows, um, it, because the Sparkle server runs on both Windows and Linux, but I'm just more comfortable with the Windows interface. So I selected Windows Server 2008 and just did a standard VM instance. And I went ahead and I spun this up, and here's my Windows instance. And you can see it's an N1 standard with four CPUs and 15 gigs of memory. And this is running in US Central 2 Windows. Um, and then I worked with Algebraics to get uh, the server installed because it's not a public preview right now. You'd have to work with them. So once I did that, then I RDP'd into my instance and I'll show you what that looks like. And here's my Windows server instance. So nothing too exciting there. It's just a standard Windows server instance running on the Google Cloud. And then uh, for the purposes of demo, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the Sparkle server. And before I do this, I'm going to just clear out data from the previous demo. And I'm going to turn on my Sparkle server. And I'm just going to minimize this. So in order to take a look at the SP2 bench queries, I'm going to open up a, an interface that is not something that's really part of the Algebraics product. They just use it for demoing. This is an open source uh, uh, Sparkle query tool called Flint. Um, so you can see it's a Flint client. So it's not intended for uh, really production use, it's more just for testing, um, but it'll suffice for our purposes. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and load some data. So I'm going to say update, and then I'm going to go over to the sample which they've set up, and I'm just going to click on this file copy to load this file copy in. Uh, and you'll notice that once I click submit, Actually, this is loading 100,000 triples, just for the purposes of um, looking at some of these benchmark queries. So uh, once I've done that, then I'm going to go ahead and set my mode to query. And then uh, what Algebraics has done in the sample here is they've, they've loaded up the benchmark queries that they were evaluated on with the other RDF stores, so that you can take a look at how this performs in your particular environment. And of course, um, I'm just going to click to load this query. And you can see this is a very, very basic query. It's kind of a smoke test query. Um, and if you're new to the Sparkle query language, I'll, I'll throw in a reference. I'll overlay it here. Um, I would recommend that you pick up a Sparkle query book because it's, it's a new type of a query language. And I'll go ahead and click Submit. And you can see there's the output, and it comes out as CSV. And you can also, in this tool, output as XML. And you can output as JSON. Now, um, this is really, again, just a tool sitting on top of their engine so that you can get a sense of how these queries perform. So the queries, if I go back over here to samples, are progressively more um, computationally intensive. And they have a benchmarking tool, I'll just load the second query here, that actually shows how the queries improve in execution over time because of the uh, way that their engine works. So I'm going to go ahead and click Submit. 
and you can see the results down here. So if you are interested, and I'll just do a couple more, what I recommend that you do is you go ahead and you work with Algebraics to get access to an implementation that works for you, whether it's on-premise or not. You start with the samples so you can get a sense, especially if you're new to RDF and Sparkle uh, query language and all that good stuff. And then you start working with some data that's of interest for your particular domain. So this is just really the sort of the simplistic way that you would work with their demo. Um, so I, I just went ahead and submitted that query. And this query is a little bit more computationally intense, so I'll just run this one. And I'll just go ahead and submit. And then you see the results. So in addition to this, if you wanted to, and you got access to their demo, you could also work with um, the optional queries, which are um, a set of queries that, and again, I'll load this data up here just to show you how this works, which, which are a set of queries that are a little bit um, even more complex, just to give you a sense of um, what query possibilities are available. So I'm going to go ahead and submit, because those other queries were based on the benchmark queries. So these are queries that really show the power of the Sparkle server. We start out with a lot deeper complexity in the query here, just to give you a sense of it. And again, the, um, the uh, execution mode is a little bit cut off because of the size of my screencast, but you can see there's the output. If you are intrigued, uh, go ahead and contact them, and when they make their uh, public beta available, they'll work with you. I happen to set it up on, on um, my um, Google Cloud instance here because I like to be able to look at the overhead. So now that you've seen the demo, if you want to understand more about how the product works, they're very early in their product development uh, release cycle. Um, they actually do not have a commercially released product yet. However, they are releasing a beta um, to interested parties starting uh, just very shortly after this recording, July 1st. You can take a look at the site demo.algebraicsdata.com and you can run some of these benchmark queries and you can understand a bit more about the math um, behind their um, query engine and uh, the use cases for the Sparkle server. As I mentioned, they have uh, a number of patents around their mathematical implementation and uh, is one of the reasons I took a look at the product and have been doing some um, early prototyping with them. If you do want to try it out, you go to their main website page and you click on the link that I have highlighted here, sign up for the Sparkle Server Evaluation, and then Algebraics will contact you when notified um, this July. You can then uh, work with the Sparkle Server. They are very interested in what use cases you might have because they are uh, very early in their product cycle. The engine is solid, built, and tested, but in terms of the tools and the, the uh, integration points into the engine, there's still some work to be done, and they're trying to work with various customers to understand um, how to build it out for their particular use cases. So our next problem set that we're going to look at is uh, I think kind of in the middle of the road. The first set we looked at was a huge a volume of information coming in that needed to be uh, spiky and scalable, an incredible volume of information. Our second set looked at a large volume of very, very complex data that needed to be evaluated. This third set of problems is kind of in the middle, a very large volume of data coming in that needs to be uh, queried in a very complex way. So as an example, we're going to take a look at this GDELT project. So the GDELT project runs on the next database that I'm interested in showing you, which is called Google BigQuery. Um, so what this is is a implementation of monitoring events around the world and then working with that data to produce various um, outputs um, based on the information coming in. So uh, if I just go in here and take a look at this, you can see the, the goal is to watch the entire world. And um, GDELT monitors print, broadcast, and web news media in over 100 languages, every country in the world. So once you have this information coming in, then how do you work with it? And you can actually get this data set and work with it independent of BigQuery, but this, is, um, this implementation uses this particular solution. So what is BigQuery? BigQuery is Query as a Service on the Google Cloud. Um, it has an interactive, restful web um, 
service and an interface that you can try out. It's just literally a browser. You generally will, will write code against it with your particular application. It has a very SQL-like language, very close to ANSI SQL. It's not exactly ANSI SQL. It's very fast, benchmarked at 750 million rows in under 10 seconds. It includes a lot of capabilities with the product, such as security. It uses OAuth for access control. It has integration with other Google Cloud products, such as Google Cloud Storage and even Google Sheets in terms of visualization or Google Spreadsheets, and as well as other products. So first of all, the benchmark. This is an independent uh, benchmark where several data warehousing big data solutions were benchmarked by a group of researchers at a university. This includes relational, so you can see in here Postgres, along with Amazon Redshift. And this, um, this TPC benchmark where BigQuery did so well is for a particular type and class of query. So I've, I've referenced the paper in the in the slide notes so you can look up the type of queries for which BigQuery is most suitable. So in the demo, I'm going to go ahead and show you querying uh, with GDELT against BigQuery. And uh, I'm going to show you with the browser. So in order to work with um, any of Google's cloud products, you need to just make a project that includes the service uh, BigQuery. In order to do that, you just simply turn it on. There's a pretty generous free tier, but also as part of this presentation, I'll give you a code so you can sign up for $500 of usage credit, which um, for testing is really more than sufficient. So once you sign up within your project, uh, then you will have access to BigQuery, and, and you just click on it, and I have it already pre-staged over here. And inside of BigQuery, there's really two aspects of working with it. One is jobs, the other one is queries. And what I've done is I've taken the GDELT uh, data, which is uh, uploaded every day, and here is a sample query that will return uh, a significant amount of information. And you can get a sense of the richness of the SQL that's supported, even things like windowing functions. You can see the over partition by. So for those of us that come out of the relational world, we can really leverage our SQL query skills inside of here. And I'll just go ahead and rerun this query. And you can see in 3.5 seconds, it ran uh, seven gigabytes of data. BigQuery truly earns its name in that you can push data up to BigQuery and basically play around with it very, very easily. Of course, not everybody can send data to the cloud, so this is the difference between the three products that I've uh, shown here. Google BigQuery does require that you send the query, the, send the data up to their cloud. So uh, once you get the results, then you can download a CSV or save as table. You can see four queries. There are options inside here where you can run interactively or batch if you move this into production and you can have some latency. You can actually save money that way. So it's important that you read the, read the docs on this as well. And then in terms of uh, this interface, like I said, there's a query history and a job history. Jobs is uh, moving data in and out, and queries is, of course, queries. So in addition to um, doing the query, you can also look at the, the, the data, of, and you can see there's the schema information and the details about the event table about the GDELT project so that you can understand there's 88 gigs of data, and it's a great um, use for you to start working with BigQuery. So I think BigQuery is a great bleeding edge database in that um, it's very simple to use. You just load the data with um, text or JSON. It does support uh, streaming up to 100K uh, inserts per second now. It's a new, um, it turned up the ingestion rate recently. Uh, and then you write your query. And as I said, it has um, very strong SQL support, including windowing functions, aggregates, and also includes some what I call analytic SQL, so things like standard deviation, variance, correlation, and uh, regex matching. Uh, and the price is really very competitive at $5 per terabyte processed, and the storage is around $30 per terabyte per month. In addition to the query example that I showed you um, to get you started with this, there is a site called Big Queries with the .es that has um, a number of sample queries against sample data. Um, the one that I particularly like is the GitHub archive, and you can see in here they have some fun queries like which programming languages induce the most anger. In addition to the uh, capabilities of BigQuery, another reason to take a look at it is there's quite a lot of integration. As I mentioned earlier, you can integrate easily with Google Sheets. Also, there's a connector to Microsoft Excel. It's really useful when you're doing some of these projects to do some type of visualization 
um, of the data when you're on early prototyping so that the people who are funding the project can get some sense of what it is they're paying for. So to try it out, uh, you set up a Google Cloud account, upload or stream data, and query. And because you're watching this presentation, you can take advantage of the fact that I'm a Google Cloud developer expert, and you can use my code GDE hyphen in with this cloud.google.com uh, WAC developers WAC starter pack, and you can get $500 of credit if you want to use a Google BigQuery or if you want to try out Aerospike on the Google Cloud or if you want to try out Algebraics on the Google Cloud. So um, I really find the Google Cloud works fantastic for testing different data solutions, like I said, because the instances are very powerful and they spin up very quickly and um, their cost, uh, cost is right for the testing purposes that I, that I use commonly. So next steps with the Bleeding Edge databases is to spend some time trying them out to see if they work for your particular solutions. I encourage you with any of these Bleeding Edge solutions to actually get your hands on them see what it's like for you to work with them, see how much effort it will take, see what value it's returning, and um, see if you can validate the benchmarks that um, have caused you to take a look at these types of data, data solutions. In addition to the big data work that I do, um, another thing that I would like you to consider and take a look at is um, from a different domain, and that domain is education of our kids. So I am the co-founder of a nonprofit called Teaching Kids Programming, and our product is a set of open source uh, courseware designed to be used by school teachers with middle school aged children to introduce them to programming concepts using the Java programming language. So again, I'm Lynn Langett, and hopefully you found this presentation useful. Uh, uh, this is data on the bleeding edge, and um, I welcome your feedback on this video, and if you have um, data solutions that you'd like me to take a look at, please write it in the comment section and um, have a great day.